Good morning, everybody. Called by name in our baptism and grateful to baptize two beautiful little girls here today, we are gathered as priests, as prophets, as members of a royal family destined to live forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love and healing mercy, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love and tender mercy of God the Father, and all the gifts of their Spirit be with you. Amen. The readings pack a punch today. Not only do they challenge us, with the prophetic message of truth, but they also insist that we bring that message to the world. For the times we've resisted the word ourselves, and for the times, whether because of fear or apathy, we have not announced the gospel in our daily lives, we ask God to forgive us. Lord. Lord Jesus, you are a prophetic word of healing and forgiveness. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ Jesus, you are a prophetic word of comfort and hope. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you announce the prophetic word in the world through our witness. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. So may Almighty God have mercy on you. Forgive us our sins and bring us together to life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Please, God, let the light of your truth guide us safe home to your kingdom through this world filled with lights contrary to your own. Christian is the name and the gospel we glory in. And so we pray this morning that your love would make us, Father, all that you have called us to be, for earth and for heaven, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, if you would be seated and brace yourselves, we hear the word of God. A reading from the book of the prophet Amos. Amaziah priest of Bethel, said to Amos, Off with you, visionary, flee to the land of Judah. There earn your bread by prophesying, but never again prophesy in Bethel. For it is the king's sanctuary in a royal temple. Amos answered Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor have I belonged to a company of prophets. I was a shepherd and a dresser of sycamores. The Lord took me from the following the flock and said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. As he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, to be holy and without blemish before him. In love, he destined us for adoption to himself through Jesus Christ, in accord with the favor of his will, for the, play, for the praise of the glory of God's grace that he granted us in the Beloved. In him, we have redemption by his blood, the forgiveness of transgressions, in accord with the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, he has made, no, made known to us the mystery of his will in accord with his favor, that he set forth in him as a plan for the fullness of times to sum up all things in Christ, in heaven and on earth. The word of the Lord. According to Mark. Jesus summoned the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for the journey but a walking stick, no food, no traveling bag, no money in their belts. They were, however, to wear sandals, but not a second tunic. And he said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave. Whatever place does not welcome you or listen to you, leave there and shake the dust off your feet in testimony against them. So they went off, and they preached repentance. The twelve drove out many demons, and they anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord. First of all, a warm welcome as we reach the midpoint of the summer. Uh, a warm welcome to all of you, our regular members, perhaps some of you just back from vacation, maybe others of you chomping at the bit to go on vacation in the second half of the summer. And we also welcome any who may be visitors and guests with us in the assembly today, maybe passing through our home uh, visiting uh, family members who are parishioners, uh, the Feast of St. Benedict yesterday reminds us from his rule for monasteries that the visitor should be re received as Christ himself in Christian communities. And so if you are a visitor today, we receive you as Christ. We trust that somehow he is present to us 
through you. And we hope that your time with us will be a blessing for you as well. And we're especially grateful this morning to be baptizing uh, two young little girls. This is Jamie Marion Case. Abby and Michael's uh, second boy, right? Um, she's in a 60-plus-year-old uh, baptismal gown. I think both of the children are today. But uh, this is, uh, this is uh, Jamie Marion Case. And uh, we'll be baptizing during Mass. She'll be baptized after Mass. We'll be baptizing Rebecca Grace Lewis, her mom and dad, uh, Monica and Ryan. Uh, they're just coming up, if I remember right, on their second wedding anniversary. And uh, so uh, we want to congratulate you, moms and dads, on this amazing thing that you're doing, that God is doing in your Christian marriage. I had the privilege of witnessing both of your wedding vows uh, that God has created because you love each other, new life in your image and likeness, because that's how genetics go, but also in God's image and likeness. And we're also very, very grateful, moms and dads, that you have both the pride to bring your children to church. It's okay to show them off what a beautiful prize they are, but also the humility to bring them to church for baptism. Because you're asking us, or acknowledging that you can't do it all alone. It takes a parish to raise a Christian child. It takes mom and dad, of course, first and best teachers, godparents too. Grandparents have a special place. But along with that, it takes a whole church family to raise little girls, little girls and boys, to grow up, to know Jesus and fall in love with him and go wherever he leads. And so we congratulate you and we gladly, as your church family today, we gladly take our role not just pastor, but all of us together in promising to help you to raise these beautiful little girls, Jamie and Rebecca, as Christians, as Roman Catholics, as members of the family of faith at Our Lady of Lourdes, so that they'll come to know Jesus and fall in love with him and follow wherever he calls them. Because we know if, he, if they do that, it won't always be easy or predictable, but it will be life for them, full life for earth and for heaven. And so Abby and Michael, Monica and Ryan, we congratulate you today and welcome your daughters among us. I think I put, no, oh, did I put you to sleep? No, not yet. <laughs> there you go, Mommy, nice safe pass there. There we go. Yeah. Also, in case there's anybody in the assembly uh, with a, uh, an electronic or digital device wanting to take a picture and send to the bishop that I'm wearing pink when it should be green today, uh, I just want to say that uh, blame it on Father Conrad and Father Jim. It has been long standing since the beginning of Our Lady of Lourdes that the celebrant wears pink on the Pink Flamingo weekend in the pier. <laughs> and especially this particular pink vestment, it's new to us, has special meaning for uh, uh, Rebecca Grace's family, her cousin Minnie Pritchard, and uh, her mom and dad. And so, uh, whether you like it or not, it's pink today, even though it clashes with the rest of the colors around here. But anyway, let's get to work. Uh, as you might guess, uh, uh, living with a group of priests, uh, our youngest, Father Matthew, is 28. Our oldest, Father Vincent, is, I think, 97 these days. Uh, that we'll sit around, maybe at supper or lunch, and talk about the life of the church, or maybe over a cold beer before supper sometimes. And uh, especially we've been following Pope Francis. And I have to say that uh, both the older guys among us and the younger guys among us are all exhausted by the pace that Pope Francis keeps. He's traveling all over the world. He's got a homily or a encyclical or a remark off the cuff or from the heart. Uh, every day, if you miss just a few days, you miss a lot with Pope Francis. And so we're talking about it and some of the things he's been saying in the last two and a half years, in the last two and a half days down in South America. We're wondering what kinds of things he's going to be saying when he shows up in New York and Philadelphia and Washington, D.C., addressing Congress in September. You bet, you bet. It's going to be something. And uh, uh, Father Boswick just sort of sits and lets the conversation go by. But every once in a while, he'll just remind us with a smile and a little bit of mischief. Guys, 
I sure hope Pope Francis has a food testing. I sure hope Pope Francis has someone to try his food to make sure it's safe and poison free before he sits down to enjoy his meal. Because he's stirring up a lot of dust. And some of the dust, it's inside. Uh, I learned it while I was on retreat. Uh, I remember the headline, uh, December 19th, right before Christmas, he called the Curia together. Those are the bishops and the archbishops and the Monsignori and all the bureaucrats in Vatican City uh, who make the church go or maybe keep the church from going. And uh, it was right before Christmas. They thought they were going to get a bonus, maybe a little bit of cake and ice cream, maybe a special present from the Pope. You know what he gave them? A talk. A dressing down in public. Dear brothers, here are 15 diseases that I observe in the curia, in the bureaucracy of the church, that you need to work on. No Christmas bonus. Coal in their stocking, at least for Christmas of 2014. Well, anyway, in Norbertine, our Abbot General, Father Thomas, uh, he wrote, uh, thinking about the theory that uh, those diseases, careerism, cold-heartedness, lack of compassion, putting oneself at the center of the world, feeling that one is indispensable, eager to climb up the tree and to get ahead on the ladder, even if it means climbing over or hurting somebody. Father Thomas said to Norbertines, I just grabbed his article at, uh, on my way out to retreat, was reading it uh, along the lakeside in uh, Collegeville. His theory is that those diseases can beset Norbertine communities too. Oops. And Norbertine individuals as well. And so I'm reading this list of 15 and I realize, oh my gosh, Tim, you're guilty of at least six. You're guilty big time of at least two. How do you feel about Pope Francis now? Luckily, there was an old Benedictine monk willing to hear my confession on the 4th of July afternoon. He didn't have anything better to do. He seemed to understand. He gave me some advice, helped to celebrate the Lord's forgiveness and move me on. But the food testers are necessary, first of all, within the church because Francis has shaken up the internal life of our church in the bureaucracy, in the diocese, in the parish. There's one bishop quoted as hoping he wouldn't live too long before he doesn't, does too much damage. How crazy is that? But it's also outside the church. If you followed the Francis stuff this week, you would have heard uh, that uh, Francis himself said, a bishop behind a bulletproof piece of glass. That's crazy. You would have heard that Francis himself said, I prefer the chaos. I like to wade into the crowd and meet people and be able to give them a hug or let them hug me. And if you listen to the security precautions that are being put in place here in the United States, they're melting down in New York City because Pope Francis is scheduled to celebrate Mass in Madison Square Garden right at rush hour with one of the big hubs of the New York subway right beneath the floor of Madison Square Garden. Or Philadelphia has decided to put up a fence around the whole of Center City to ensure the Pope's safety. In Washington, they're building like an inauguration platform. He's going to be uh, addressing Congress first, the House and the Senate, and then he's going to come outside and address the American people from the steps of the Capitol. And even the Secret Service realized they can't control this crazy guy Bergoglio from Argentina. And they can't control what will happen. Maybe ISIS. Maybe just some remnant of the know-nothings who don't want the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church speaking to Americans. Maybe just someone who disagrees with him. Because he's going to lay it on the line. Not only for the bureaucrats of the church, but for the world. He has already this week. He told the president of Bolivia in public, your poor must be your first priority. Your poor and weak must be your first priority. Not more business. Not more making money. You think people aren't going to push back from that? Or his encyclical, 
speaking about us not raping Mother Earth, destroying rainforest in the third world, leaving communities impoverished and unable to sustain themselves and forced to move into the city while we take the fruit of the rainforest up to the first world for our boats and panel dens and houses. People are going to push back. Father Rod uh, Fenzel, he's 87, 60 years a priest, he noticed, he said to me the other night after Mass on Friday, he said, hey Tim, did you hear what the Pope said today? No, Father Rod, I haven't caught up with him yet. He said, quote, capitalism is the dung of Satan. And then he came back to me yesterday morning and said, hey Tim, I misreported yesterday. CNN reported that the Pope said capitalism is the dove of Satan. What the Pope actually said, Father Rod googled it, unbridled capitalism is the dove of Satan. Out of control, I want more and more and more and more and more, is an attitude of the devil himself. You see how even the media subtly is trying to push back to discredit him or getting us fighting over him. And maybe some of you are feeling uncomfortable or even fed up by this point in the homily, if you'd want to call it a homily this morning. And maybe I'll need to get a food tester before I go over to Culver's or somewhere else. The other thing, it hits close to home for me. The Pope said, enough of this living in front of electronic and digital devices. Enough of us communicating with each other with smartphones and iPads and iPods and ne never actually learning how to sit down and talk with each other or give each other a hug or let each other see a tear or a belly laugh or just enjoy the silence with someone who means the world to you. Enough of this artificial communication that unlearns us how to be with each other as brothers and sisters, as family and friends and community. There'll be pushback for sure. There'll be lots of pushback. But I want to suggest to you this morning, brothers and sisters, that Pope Francis is for us here and now a prime example of this prophetic word that we heard about last week that most times people don't want to listen to. This prophetic word which we are called to announce in the world. It has two sides, this sword. It will comfort us when we are overwhelmed, when we are tempted to despair, when we have lost all hope, when we've screwed up ourselves or just fall exhausted not knowing what to do next, confused by life. Then God's word is always mercy and healing and hope. God will never abandon us. God will never stop loving us. He's invested his own son in us, for God's sake. He's never going to walk away. But the other side of the sword is a challenge, brothers and sisters, that we have to respond to God's love, that we have to take to heart the truth of the gospel, that we who have been given much have a responsibility to share generously, even radically, so that no one goes without what they need, since God gave enough for everybody at the beginning. And not only are we called to live this, we are called to announce it. Like poor Amos in the first reading, he goes to Bethel to prophesy, to announce the challenge and comfort of God's word. And the priest gets torqued, probably like the Kuri in the Vatican on December 19th. Amaziah, get out of here! Who are you to tell us about religion? Who are you to announce such demoralizing and disheartening words? Who are you to tell us we have to change? And Amos is quick. Hey, wait a minute, you guys. I'm no prophet. I didn't ask for this job. I'm a shepherd. I prune sycamore trees, for God's sake. But God is sending me, so I got to tell you what God wants me to tell you. What else can I do? Somewhere deep in Amos, he realized what Paul says in the second reading, that if God calls us to do something, God will not hold back any spiritual gift that's necessary. In fact, we receive those spiritual gifts, as Rebecca and Jamie will, in our baptism. And every time we listen to the Word and share in the body and blood of Christ, we have everything we need 
to do what God asks. So he sends the twelve out. And you notice in this relatively short gospel today, Jesus knows that there's going to be blowback, that there's going to be pushback, that some places they're not going to love like what the apostles are having to say. Love your enemy, forgive your persecutor, pray for them. And so Jesus fortifies them. You have what you need, but if they won't listen to you, then shake the dust from your feet. Shake their dust from your feet and go somewhere else. But you have to keep at it. Because without the message, the world will blow itself up. The world will blow itself up then and now. And that's where it falls to us, brothers and sisters. When we were baptized, we became, among other things, prophets. It's not just Father's job or Bishop Rickard or Pope Francis's job to get the word out. It's your job. It's my job. It's our job together to speak the uncomfortable truth of the gospel, no matter how the world will respond. And part of that starts in a very personal way. I mean, Abby and Mike, Monica and Brian, as parents, you learn, you will learn the lesson that all parents learn, huh? That sometimes you have to get in your kid's face. Because if you don't, their life will run out of control. Sometimes you have to offer consistent and fair and predictable discipline. Sixth grader launches the F-bomb at the supper table. No, 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 that's not how we talk in a Christian home. Freshman in high school says, oh, I don't feel like going to Mass today. I'm not going to go. No, no, no. That's not how we live in a Christian home. We worship on Saturday evening or Sunday. 15-year-old kid gets busted at a beer party. Mom or dad has to get in their face. This is not acceptable behavior. This is not a wink and a nod because Wisconsin is America's drunkest state. No, you cannot do this. This is not safe for you and your friends. And you're grounded, by the way, until kingdom come, whatever kingdom come is. I'd be a terrible parent. I'd be so afraid. <laughs> but without any restrictions on our children, they'll just presume anything I do is all right. If parents become best friends, well then who are they to tell me what to do? And our children will never know that they are loved. Loved so much that mom and dad will get in their face and be willing to expect and absorb the blowback. You don't understand anything. I'll never grow up to be like you. Discipline, the prophetic word of discipline, Christian discipline, is how a mom or dad, a grandma or grandma, loves their child. Because as beautiful as they are, they're not going to be right all the time. They're not going to be perfect. They're not going to make every best choice. Did you? Did I? Did any of us? Of course not. And those who are teachers and coaches, too. Just letting anything go as you critique your students' homework. Just letting any effort go on the soccer field or the basketball court. That's not going to bring out excellence in anybody. You have to be willing. Thank God most times it's other people's kids that you have to deal with instead of your own on the court. To correct. To work them. To work them hard over and over again. Sister Patricia Ann Walsh, I thought she was certifiably nuts, my 8th grade English teacher at St. Pius, and she didn't have much time for our class either. You could write a brilliant paper for Sister Patricia Ann, but if you used a semicolon instead of a colon, she'd bleed red all over your paper, and she'd deduct points, and your brilliant thesis could be worth a C-plus after all of her grammatical corrections were done. And I realized 50 years out, that I know the English language in writing and in speaking because of crazy sister Patricia Ann Walsh, God rest her soul. Because she cared enough about us, even though we didn't care about her at the time, to correct us, to get up in our faces, to insist that we do our best. Of course, those who are in the workplace, you know too, the business or, or teenagers in high school of standing up, and challenging behavior that's inappropriate or wrong? There's enough of the trampling of the gift of human sexuality in our culture to die over. 
But who will stand up and say that's an inappropriate joke? That's an inappropriate movie or way to talk about another human being in the image and likeness of God. And you can bet, for those of us in first world countries, Father Bostrick was also observing yesterday when I talked to him that if Pope Francis was speaking to the House of Commons, they heckle all the time. They'd be throwing their shoes at Pope Francis by the end of the third sentence. Probably our American Congress will be more genteel. As he says, you have too much. 7% of the Earth's population determining 80% of the Earth's resources. You have too much. And it's not making you happy. And you need to share and take care of those who don't have enough. And find your soul again, united under God, seeking God's will, the religious purpose for which this nation was founded. You can bet a lot of people aren't going to like it. And you can bet there will probably be, we hopefully won't hear about them because they're not successful, there'll be more than one attempt on Francis's life. And on ours too, if we speak that way in the workplace, or at the tavern, or on the golf course, or around the bridge table, or wherever else it might be. But that's our job, brothers and sisters, to speak the truth. If we have to hire food testers, so be it. If we have to wear combat boots, okay. If we have to absorb the world's anger and rejection, well then so did he, and he was not conquered. And so we baptized two beautiful little babies today. We'll spot them a few years in terms of their duties as baptized Christians. But they become today, these two little girls, they become priests. Their job to join the rest of us in offering the great thanksgiving, the victory of Christ, his body and blood, Sunday in and Sunday out. They become, by baptism, members of a royal family that God has destined to live forever. Not just 90 or 100 years on earth, but forever in heaven. And these antique baptismal garments that both of them are wearing today, they foreshadow the funeral pall, which will be placed on their caskets at the end of their lives, 90 or 100 years out, reminding their survivors that they were called to heaven on the baptismal day as their final goal. And moms and dads, I hope it's okay with you, but baptism today also makes them prophets to learn the truth and know the truth, to accept its comfort and correction, and then to go out and get in the world's face with the gospel truth as their lives are unfolding. They're never going to take this prophet stuff on unless they see us do it. Living. Moms and dads, godparents, grandma and grandpa, and the rest of us. And so if your faith makes you ready, brothers and sisters, to live the faith, to announce the gospel by our lives in the world, strengthened as we are here. Would you please stand and claim this faith which we are about to share. So dear brothers and sisters, may I ask you, even though it's tempting to do otherwise, certainly easier, do you reject Satan, all his evil works and empty promises? Do you reject them all? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth and all they contain, who has made us male and female in the divine image and likeness, and who loves us, each one, the way moms and dads love their children? Do you believe? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, God's Son and Mary's child, born humbly in a barn, growing in age and wisdom and grace to be a wise teacher, a powerful healer and a merciful friend, but rejected for this godly work, arrested, tortured, executed and buried in a borrowed grave, but because he was faithful despite the bullback, even death, raised up from the tomb and alive forever in God's presence. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Amen. And do you believe in the Holy Spirit that keeps gathering us together as the Holy Catholic Church 
one generation to the next, Sunday after Sunday, daring to be, believe we are in communion with all those who have gone on ahead, believing that God can forgive all sins, awaiting the resurrection of those who have died and the life of the world to come. Do you believe this? It is our faith, the faith of the Church. We're proud to profess it. We're glad to live it in the world and delighted to share it this day with two beautiful little girls through Christ our Lord. And so, Monica and Ryan, is it your will that your daughter, Rebecca Grace, be baptized in this faith? And Maureen and Rich, do you promise to support these Christian parents in helping her to grow in the faith? And do you promise to model especially the prophetic vocation of our faith, people of God and Our Lady of Lewis? When the assembly can be seated, we're all envious of you. You get to go swimming in church, little girl. So Rebecca, Grace, Lewis, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That you might come to know Jesus, love Him, follow Him wherever He leads. We anoint you with His Holy Spirit that does make you priests, prophet, and member of the royal family of faith, the Church, with a heavenly destiny one day. And we recognize in your white garment the outward sign of your dignity now as a Christian person, with mom and dad and godparents and your family and our Church to help you, Rebecca, preserve that Christian dignity to a full share of eternal life. We'll give you to God another Marie now. That's so fast. Rebecca Grace, receive the light of Christ. Let it enlighten your mind to know his truth, to make your heart compassionate and tender-hearted like the heart of Jesus. Let the light of the gospel and its joy guide through your steps in a long, long, long gospel life in this world. And one day, far, far off, when you must stand before the shadows of death, let the light of Christ make you confident and unafraid. Let it lead you to heaven. And see this light, not only in a little candle, but in the words and deeds, the lives of mom and dad and godparents, your family and our church family at Lourdes, who promise to give you a good example as you grow up. And so another prophet, who knows how she'll get up in our face and challenge us as she grows, Rebecca Grace Lewis. We welcome her to the family. Because of our baptismal call, we trust in God's love, like the love of moms and dads for their children. And so full of faith, we offer our petitions now as we stand in Jesus' name. Our response will be, Lord, hear our prayer. That the church may be a prophetic call for the resolution of the hearts in injustices between and among nations, races, and persons, we pray. Lord, we love prayer. That our nation may be open to the prophets who call us again to the goal of being united under God, defending the inalienable rights of, to life for all persons, and that we, we may be generous and compassionate with the bounty God has given us, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That our parish family at Lourdes, now in our 20th year, may continue to grow in the gospel purpose and hospitality for which God has gathered us, and that this may be a healed and healing place, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That those in need of physical, emotional, or spiritual healing may find comfort in the gospel, in compassion from our outreach to them, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That the prophets in our midst may be sustained 
regardless of the results of their ministry, in that we may hear and heed their message. We pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That favorable weather, safety, and joy may mark the summer growing season, this time of refreshment and gratitude. We pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That all those who have died, especially Sue Jansen, William Green, and Mary Long, who were buried this week, and particularly David Lydell, may experience the full healing and joy promised by the gospel for the eternal kingdom of God, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. We pause, the... we pause in a moment of silence to add our personal needs and intentions. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Jamie and Rebecca on their baptismal day and their moms and dads, that what is done here, what God does here, through this ritual, might bear fruit, we pray. Receive our spoken and silent prayers, Almighty God, and bless us with every spiritual gift to live the gospel and announce the gospel by our life as your church, through Christ our Lord. Amen. If you'd be seated, the table of our strength is prepared.